Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, you can remember to support, to share, and to subscribe. You may subscribe wherever it is that you are hearing this. You may share the very words of God you hear read aloud and recited by me or the link to where you found this. And in addition, you can support by subscribing either to the YouTube channel by joining the channel, rather, uh, subscription was the other thing I mentioned. So by joining the YouTube channel or by subscribing to the newsletter, aksum.substack.com or becoming a patron uh, or a patron at patreon.com slash tawahado. Today we are in the scroll of Revelation, the book of the Apocalypse of Uncovering, chapter 17. As always, we will tread lightly by going through the KJV, verses 1 to 6. And there came one of the seven messengers, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Some versions try to sanitize this woman by calling her profession that great oldest of professions, a prostitute. In even more contemporary days, people have begun to sanitize this term by saying sex worker, and I'm even partial to some of those decriminalization arguments, but I'm not so partial to the silliness of saying sex worker. Let us use the KJV or other versions that make it plain. They say whore and they say harlot, and we'll see this defined at the end of this chapter, and remember that chapters are arbitrary according to the original scripture, but at the end of this we will see the death whatever we want to call her, and she is a city. She is the world hegemon, the chief power at the time. And we remember, as I've mentioned many times as we've gone through Revelation or the Uncovering or the Apocalypse, that Babylon is called Rome by Holy Peter, who lived in Rome. And I live in America, and it is undeniable that the United States of America are the 21st centuries Babylon or Rome or world hegemon or power. Well, Aksum or Ethiopia is not that in the 21st century. There were times where Ethiopia or Aksum could be considered that. We have the Persian philosopher Mani, who is famously quoted by many Ethiopians as referring to Aksum or Ethiopia as one of the four major world powers alongside Rome, alongside Persia, which is, of course, a replacement of Babylon, and alongside China. The waters here, or the many waters, are very fascinating. I'll dig back to the Hebrew to bring you the word Mayim, and Mayim has a cognate in Ge'ez, Mayat, and in Amharic, it's not a cognate, but I'll throw it in for good measure, Wuhuch. The waters are that great unknown, that great uncontrollable, 
uh, the people would travel often along the waters and they had no idea. They would pontificate and the pontification is the root of many evils. They would pontificate about the many monsters that might be there in the sea, the sea monsters that might gobble them up, that might swallow them whole, that might destroy them. Uh, it's very funny, even in the Amharic translation of Job, the, the word for Leviathan is translated as a hippopotamus. So, you know, the hippopotamus, one of the great killers of humankind in the world, although it doesn't seem so fearsome when you look at it, it looks soft and gelatinous, but it is a very, very scary beast. And it's only one of the many things alongside the, the real and imagined beasts of prey that are hidden within the waters that the human being cannot fully control the waves, the maelstroms, the hurricanes, all the elements that would happen in the waters led to them fearing the waters. And yet those things that are so scary are also the things by which God saved his people time after time after time, be it the story of Noah, be it the story of Moses, be it the story of baptism in the New Testament. And finally, you see Holy John is granted discernment, granted the ability to see what is this harlot, what is this whore, versus what is the Holy Church, what is of the Spirit, by being dragged not into the city, not into the city-state, not into the empire, which is being critiqued here, but into the wilderness, where there are no bad-made constructs, but only the God-made constructs, and where you're able to fully place your trust in the Lord, who is going to have to provide for you in this desolate area where the dastardly elements can get rid of you at any moment, be it a beast of prey or be it one of the winds or the fires or the lightning bolts that may come at you. Verses 7 to 14. And the messenger said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them." For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Here you have the great battle taking place again. You have all of the powers of the world which are vying to become the hegemon or the world power, the head power, the chief amongst the powers. And so in that, they worship the hegemon. They worship the head beast. They worship lesser empires, worship the greater empire, lesser kingdoms, worship the greater kingdom. The lesser governments worship the greatest government, the one that is overpowering them all. Here, I will rely upon St. Andrew of Caesarea from the translation of Dr. Eugenia Constantinou, who has great Bible study podcast that 
really fed me greatly back from 2013 to 2014. And she was very open with me as I emailed her some very tough questions about the Bible, and she gave me her best takes. So anyway, Andrew of Caesarea via Presbytida, aka Dr. Jeannie Constantinou, says that these verses here have a pre-cross, a cross, and a post-cross judgment kind of elements to them. The pre-cross is the was, is the past tense being used. The cross destroys the beast, and yet the beast is going to be brought out again for the final judgment, for that time of recognition of the wisdom of the Torah, of the instruction of the prophets, and of the extra writings, which are also called the wisdom literature. At that point, when the judgment of the beast happens before all, plainly, you will see the declaration of the Lamb as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And I I will bracket here the God of gods, which we see in the Psalms. We don't see it explicitly here, but in the daily prayers of the church, we call the Lamb, our Lord and our Savior Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and the God of gods. These things come together, and they basically mean the same thing. If there is anyone who thinks they have power, here is even greater power power. If anyone thinks they are mighty, you will be overcome. Verses 15 to the end. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So here you have a definition of not only the, the great city which we mentioned, which is the whore or the harlot or the sex worker or the prostitute, but also the waters. So the waters, as I mentioned, are unknown and uncontrollable. Here, it's referring to the Gentiles, to all the peoples, all the tongues, all the languages, all the nations. And you see the repetition with synonyms, synonymic parallelism, to emphasize all the people, not just the Jews, but all of humankind, the totality of humankind will be there to witness the judgment, which is a unilateral decision. This is not the international community. This is not the globalists and the internationalists coming together to make a decision together. This is not bipartisan legislation in the domestic politics of the United States. It is the unilateral decision of the King of Kings, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever.